baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. God bless the tennis. Thank you, thank you, Brother Landy. Now, you know that I'm going to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to Eastwood. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, thank you, Brother Landy, for those kind uh, remarks, and we are delighted to be here tonight. Of course, you know that I been in constant communication with your pastoral family and uh, have been up to visit and personally called numerous times, but I'll just feel better having passed through Eastwood and checked on the whole family. And I feel a wonderful spirit, and I cannot tell you how happy I am to see my dear friend, Brother Merle here. I never, you know, I was concerned about him, but I never was really worried about him because uh, I didn't, I, I knew the Lord wasn't through with him, and, and death can't kill what won't die. And uh, we're just thanking God for his miraculous uh, recovery and deliverance and we don't understand, but I've said many times, whenever you can't track God, you've got to trust God. Amen. And when you don't understand God's present, you trust God's history. And God's got a good history. Whether you understand his present or not, he's got a good history. And when it's all written and the present is history, it's going to be just like the history you're reading now. He's still in control. He's still God. We're on the winning team. Uh, the closer uh, David got to the threshing floor, the more bumps he had with the ark. If you're close to a threshing floor and a harvest, you're going to hit a bump. And uh, the glory may wobble a little bit, but it's not going anywhere. It'll be right here. I am so happy to have my good wife, and I want her to come. They just, TJ, bring her up here. She loves this church too. Uh, and now you, if you're a visitor here, you may not know, but a hundred years ago, I was best man in the UN's wedding and she was matron of honor. Well, more or less a hundred years ago. <laughs> and 47 years ago, they taught our youngest child how to walk. And she's nearly 50. But don't we all look good? So good to be here. And, you know, once again, and uh, Brother Merle has, has mentioned it, but once again, we have all gone through a, a stressful time together, an emotional time. And tonight is an emotional time. I was looking at my Bible this morning and turned to a scripture that I hadn't, hadn't really looked at in a long time, but it's always had a lot of meaning to me. The book of Psalms. It says, he binds up the broken, he heals the broken heart, binds them up. He tells the number of the stars, calls them by name. Great is our Lord. Great is his power. And his understanding is infinite. Now, when I was younger, I was captivated by that part of the scripture that spoke of the fact that he binds up the broken heart, heals their wounds. And the very next scripture says, and he numbers the stars and calls them all by name. I mean, that's quite a, quite a span there from somebody that's 
with a broken heart and needing their wounds bound up and then talking about the stars and calling them by name. But what means so much to me as I've gotten older is the little phrase in the next verse. It talks about his power, but infinite understanding. Infinite understanding. You're going to live through a lot of life that doesn't make any sense. But you know where you can find peace in times like that? In trust. It's not always great faith. Just trust. Trust will bring peace. Always. Because you can trust him. You don't have to understand because he understands. And I don't know why all these things happen to us. I'd just rather life be a picnic myself. But it doesn't always work out like that. The ants come to the picnic and um, make wounds and hurts. And, but thank God we've got a God that my husband has already said is in control. You don't have a thing to worry about. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And as long as you stay on the rock in the church, all is well. All is well. We love you folks. We do love you so much. And I rejoice with the rest of you. This is a very emotional time for not only Pastor, but all of us. I wasn't expecting him to be at church tonight. Isn't God good? All the time. God is good. Bless you. Thank you, Sister Tenny. And I do want to say to this church body, I personally appreciate your loyalty and faithfulness down through the years to your pastor, but especially at this time. Brother Merle and Sister Joan have been so faithful to you through many crises. And then a body oftentimes gets an opportunity to serve its leader in a time of crisis. And that's where you really prove your worth. And I, I know that this church has come through and stood by the Ewings and uh, prayed for them. And I do believe that Brother Ewing is going to come out of this with a greater anointing than he has ever had. I believe that. You know, the greatest legacy that we leave will be those who live eternally because of our actions. God really doesn't make leaders. He makes servants, and servants become leaders. And your pastor has always been a servant's leader. Before the apostles ever entered the ministry, they were ushers. They really were. Sitting people down and feeding them. So... I thank God for servants' hearts and for all of you, and I'm delighted to see you here tonight. Would you stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? I certainly hope you do not say, as one woman several years ago told her pastor after the morning service on Sunday, she said, Pastor, every sermon you preach is better than the next one. Just think about it. It'll hit you. <laughs> They're getting worse. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, and turn, we'll turn with us to Mark chapter 6. Sixth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Beginning with verse 32, Mark 6.32. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them depart, and many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all cities and out went them and came together unto him. I am not going to preach on the subject, but I could preach when man outruns God. They outwent him. They got there. They were so anxious for a divine encounter till they got there before he did. 
that kind of hunger, God notes. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. They were as sheep not having a shepherd. Well, what did they need? He began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, Five and two fishes. My subject tonight is simply this. Living in miracle territory. Living in miracle territory. I've just come by Eastwood to tell you that you are presently living in miracle territory. But Brother Teddy, can't you see the steeples knocked off and we got, uh, uh, we got the roof covered with some type of uh, temporary veneer and, and, and we had water in the church and it wasn't all in the baptistry and don't you know what our pastor's just gone through? I know all of that, but I've still come to tell you we are living in miracle territory. Not you have, not you shall be, but tonight. You are living in miracle territory. Let's lift our hands and pray God's blessings. Father, in the name of Jesus. Bless your word to the glory of God. In the name of Jesus, I take dominion over any spirit that would oppose the work of the Holy Ghost. Help us all to realize that we're, we're living miracles. We are living miracles, connected to a living God. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. When we refer to God's word, two things come to our mind. Either the Bible or a preached or taught message. You know, we'll say, I read this in the Word. Or I heard this when the Word was preached. But the first operation of the Word was not something you read, and it was not something that was preached. The first operation of the Word is in the book of Genesis. When God spoke and said, let there be, the primary purpose of the Word is to be creative. And it matters little what you've read or what you heard if it doesn't create in you new life, new hope, new light, new faith. And we often overlook the primary purpose of the word. Now, God wants to create tonight. And, and if you don't hear me and you did not read the text, if you can get a creative word from God, and something miraculous can be formed in you. And you can leave here knowing that the word has created in me. I can't explain it. Who can explain the universe? Who can explain the moon, the stars, the sun? How do the, how do the stars run without collision? How are the planets held up without pillars? I can't explain it. But they had in, placed in them by divine unction the word because God said, let there be. Everything was created by the word. That's why it has faith in it. The sun never fails to come up. The moon keeps its orbit. The stars continue to shine. Why? Because they were created by the word and anything that has the word in it stays in orbit. Now man wasn't created by the word. 
Man was created by the hands of God. There's not a part of man that wasn't God touched. God touched Adam's liver, his lungs, his heart, his feet, his hands, which proves you can be God touched and still fail God. Adam, he didn't say let there be man. He created man out of the dust of the earth with his own hands. He formed him. Now, the only thing that keeps us in orbit is the word. And since we weren't created by the word, he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You know why you're here tonight? You weren't made by the word. But to have faith, you have to have the word put in you. And as long as you got the word in you, you stay in orbit. You, you, you don't have the word, you get out of orbit. So you're here tonight to hear a word, a creative word from the Lord that regardless of your five senses, and I've often said your five senses are good evangelists for unbelief. You are living in miracle territory. Well, I don't understand that, Brother Tenney. Look, just because your ear can't smell perfume, does that mean there's no perfume? Just because your nose can't hear us sing, does that mean we didn't sing? There are some things that are evident, and yet our five senses lack evidence for their evidence. But they're there. And I want you to know that God, you know, I don't smell God, I don't feel God, I don't see God. uh, But I want you to know there is a sixth sense, a supernatural dimension a creative dimension called the miracle dimension. And there is a miracle dimension here. And I've come to tell you that right now, tonight, in this time, in this place, you are living in miracle territory. Now, the Bible said that they came to a desert place. May have been part of Sinai. And God works in deserts. He proved that for the children of Israel. You know, I, I don't understand God. God got three to five million people out in one night when they delivered them from Egyptians bondage and it wasn't a footpath it had to be a freeway at least five miles wide to get that many out in one night but then when he got there they failed the Lord and those that have studied tells us that for 40 years they moved no more at three miles an hour now God can zap and get you out in one night or he can slow you down to three miles an hour And sometimes we get impatient with the pace of God. But even though they were in a desert and they weren't moving at the speed of lightning, God was still in control and they were still living in miracle territory. The rock kept giving water and the manna kept falling in a desert. And the Bible said Jesus was in a desert place. Sometimes we look at God through our problems instead of looking at our problems through our God. God works in hard places. You don't even need a miracle if there's not a problem. I don't have any problems. You don't need a miracle. God's always going to keep a little crisis in our life to keep us dependent. Why did God place an unproductive fig tree, an unproductive fig tree with no figs? In the path of the apostles. They said there's no figs on this tree. It was to develop their faith. And oftentimes God brings us through unproductive areas to develop our faith. And they came back the next day. Well, Lord, look at that thing. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Jesus said, I saw it yesterday like you see it today. Faith declares things that can't be seen. And it's just as if it was already there. Have faith, present tense. Jesus healed the ten lepers. And as they went, the miracle was manifested. Sometimes the miracle is not manifested when you first hear it. But when you start the journey by faith, suddenly it's manifest. Some of you are carrying an unmanifested miracle but you're going to go on the word of faith. And as you travel by faith with no physical evidence, the miracle is going to manifest itself. I promise you. 
I promise you because you're moving with a promise. I'd rather have a promise than an explanation any day. Somebody said explain. Uh, you can't live on an explanation. You can live on a promise. And I'm telling you, some of you are walking unmanifested miracles. You just keep, keep walking and keep believing in spite of the fact that you can't see it. But I got a word from the Lord. Now, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle mentioned in all four Gospels. You see, the area between our task and our ability to accomplish it is what we call miracle territory. And miracles take place in miracle territories. But you got to have a miracle territory and you got to have a need. Wherever there is a need, God doesn't even knock. If there's not a need, he knocks. What do you mean? The Lord didn't knock on the upper room because there was a need and praying, believing people. But at Laodicea, they said, we're increased in goods. We have need of. So he said, I'll knock. If there is a need, I won't even knock. But if you act like you don't need, he said, I'll knock. Thank God he'll still knock. Anybody here got a need? You're open for a miracle. You are open for a miracle. Now, I, I, this feeding of the 5,000, a desert place. What an impossible situation. Five loaves, two fish, 5,000 men plus women and children. And all of this, uh, this miracle. You know what God used for a conduit for a miracle? A little boy. Well, God can't use me for a miracle. Hey, I can show you where God used a whale for a miracle. Ask Jonah. I can show you where God used a mule for a miracle. Ask Balaam. I can show you where God used a worm for a miracle. Ask Jonah. I can show you where God used a rooster to get a man's attention. Ask Simon Peter. And if God can use roosters and worms and whales, God can use me and God can use you. I'm telling you, you can be a walking miracle in the middle of a desert. <laughs> Claiming maybe what you don't see by faith. And, and God corners us sometimes to manifest our faith. Now this feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle mentioned in all four Gospels. Genesis, I believe it's 41-32, uh, tells us through Pharaoh that if God wants to establish something, he says it twice, if he really wants to establish it. That's why God said before Abraham was about to stab Isaac, Abraham, Abraham. That's why he said to Peter, Simon, Simon. That's why Jesus said, my father, my father. You establish something when you say it twice, four times. The Gospels record the miracle. The only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. It must be here. Living in miracle territory. The faithless disciples said all we got is five loaves and two fish. What are they among so many? Perception is everything. Jesus never acknowledged what they didn't have. They said 200 pennies worth of bread, of money wouldn't buy the bread we need. 200 pennies worth, and that was a lot of money. Jesus never mentioned what they didn't have. He said, what do you have? He said, well, we got five loaves and two fishes. That's enough. I'm not here to talk about what you don't have, Eastwood. I'm here to talk about what you do have. And I'm telling you, you've got a miracle in your midst. I believe the greatest days and the greatest revivals and the greatest outpourings and the greatest manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to declare right now that you're living in miracle territory. Feed your faith and starve your fear. Somebody shout yes. yes. Now there's a difference in faith and miracles. A miracle would have put the fire out in the three Hebrew children fire furnace. But faith let it burn and them not get scorched. A miracle would have killed all the lions in Daniel's den. But faith let them live and didn't bite him. 
And sometimes we want a miracle when God says, I'm just developing your faith until you get to the place and then I'll manifest. Understand, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Unseen. How do I know I'm living in miracle territory? I'm fixing to tell you. Here's how you know. When there is a need sensed by a few and each individual understands his responsibility and gives his all regardless of the odds, God works a miracle. Where'd you get that, Brother Tenney? I read that statement. I believe Dr. John Maxwell said it, and that it ain't on me. When, when there is a need sensed by a few, not everybody gets it. But each individual of those few understands his responsibility and gives his all, regardless of the odds. Then Jesus works a miracle. You know what the first miracle there was? That a little boy at the end of the day still had a lunch. Now that was a miracle. And he saved it. And you see, he brings us along. I'm going to... And, and he tells them to sit down. And the Bible said they sat down on the grass. That's the second miracle. Because they were in a desert and there is no grass. But as they were sitting down, suddenly it greened up. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. If you lie down where you are long enough, it'll green up. But as they were sitting down, oh, oh he, how we know these five loaves and three? And suddenly they said, oh, we're sitting on carpet. In a, I'm telling you, friend, I don't, it, regardless of how it looks, you could be in a desert and, and, and with nothing but a handful and it looks like a valley, but, but valleys are for us to change ourselves. Mountain peaks are for us to change direction. So when there is a need, you cannot receive a miracle without a need. Well, I don't have any problems. If you don't have any problems, let me lay hands on you. Malcolm Ford said, if you have a job... Without aggravation, you don't have a job. It's not a job. Do you understand? When there is a need, the attitude of the people, they outwent him. They wanted to get there before he did, and they were in a desert, and they didn't think about their own need of food. And when we don't think about our physical needs, he makes provision. And when he told him to feed them, the Bible said, this said he to prove them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Now it's a lot more important for him to know what I'm going to do than for me to know what I'm going to do. And he already knew he's declared the end from the beginning. And all you have to do is get in cadence with God's plan. And you can't fail because God hasn't planned any failures. So all Jesus did was emphasize the little that was apparent. And he turned the barrenness of the place into a beautiful, beautiful sitting situation. Well, I can't do anything about it. There's a lot of things you can't do anything about it. If you can't, it's not your problem. It's a fact of life. With people come problems. In fact, the longer word for people is problems. I learned a long time ago that a closed mouth gathers no feet. I don't understand everything. If God wanted me to touch my toes, he'd put them on my knees. I mean, life comes with problems, and people have these silly solutions. There's some things you just live with. 
I'm going to tell you, when God blesses us, he seldom has us in mind. God can get it to you if he can get it through you. But every miracle in the Bible began with a need or a problem or hunger. And God has blessed us to be a blessing. And Jesus let that pass through his hands and the hands of the apostles, and it multiplied. We are not the Dead Sea. We're the Sea of Galilee. We receive and we give out. And people are starved today for the majesty of God. And I I often wonder, you know, I say sometimes I need a blessing. Well, when am I going to be mature enough to say I'll be a blessing? When there is a need. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Anybody got a need? Then you're a living miracle. That's the first thing you have to have. If you don't have a need, you don't need a miracle. When there is a need, sensed by a few, one is too small a group to produce greatness. You know what the key to the power of one is? It's two. Why? When the power of one is multiplied to the nth power, it's still one. One times one times one times one times one. You just keep it going. It's still going to be what? One. But two to the 100th power is astronomical. The power of one is powerless without two. So if you can get a few, when there's a need sensed by a few, now, one can't do it, but when you, when you get together, when there's a red-hot center fire that said, we're not looking at circumstances, we're not going to feed our fears, we're going to believe our God, yes, there's a need, no, we can't explain it, but there's a few of us that sense that there is a need. Only a few of the disciples recognize the need. Everybody won't get aware of the need. Revival can begin with just two or three that are going to fast and pray. I've often said that the Sunday morning church service proves how popular the church is. The Sunday night service proves how popular the pastor is. The prayer meeting proves how popular God is. When there is a need sensed by a few... Is there just a few people here that sense the need for a great sovereign move of God even out of these these deserts that you've been coming through and you wake up with a question mark? Let me tell you about a question mark. A question mark is just an exclamation mark that got pushed out of shape. Just got bent out of shape, that's all. So just bend that thing around and turn that question mark back into an exclamation mark and said, we're living on miracle territory. Don't talk to me about a desert and don't talk to me about what we don't have. Don't talk to me about why this happened or that happened. I've come to tell you, I feel a miracle here tonight. When there is a need since by a few You don't have to have a majority to have a move of God. You just got to be sensitive. You know when the ark of God came into the camp of Israel led by Hophni and Phinehas, the two backslid sons of the prophet Eli, the people were shouting, oh, the glory's come. They were so insensitive till they didn't know the difference between God coming and God going. God wasn't coming. God was going. The next day, the Philistines had him. And I want to be sensitive enough to be able to tell the difference between God coming and God going. And I tell you, I believe, I feel God coming. Oh, it only takes a few to catch on. I don't expect all of you to make the trip. But we're headed for miracle territory. And when there is a need, since by a few. Oh, I am so hungry. Well, it takes this. It takes that. It takes the other. I had a dear friend. He's dead now. His name was Odell Cagle. Odell, about 75 years ago, started a church in Grand City, Illinois. 
And he rented a big old Methodist church that had been closed. Humongous thing, high ceilings. and It was the dead of winter and down close to zero. And it was costing an arm and a leg to heat the place. And they only had a handful of saints. They were talking about what they were going to do. One of the sisters said, Pastor Cagle, the foyer of this church, the vestibule is, is a good size. We could all get in there and just heat it. And he said, that's a good idea. So he got his 25, 30 saints, and they crammed into that vestibule. They got to heaven church, and the power of God fell. Well, they got to shouting and, and getting blessed. Well, the neighbors, because they were in the foyer, could hear them. And it was back during the uh, early days of the Depression, and they all ran out and got to looking in the window and saw all these people crammed in this vestibule. And word went out throughout the neighborhood. There is so many people in that church till they can't get them all in the building. And you know what happened? People started coming. A revival broke out and over 100 got the Holy Ghost because there was a need since by a few that said if we can't have it in the auditorium, we'll have it in the vestibule. But we're going to have revival. Oh, hallelujah. Anybody here hungry for the miraculous? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, I, I don't know about, let me, about this praying business, let me tell you something. You are one x-ray away from an amazing prayer life. You are one pink slip away from an amazing prayer life. You are one phone call away from an amazing prayer life. I want to have an amazing prayer life without the x-ray, without the pink slip, and without the phone call. And then if it comes, I'm already ready for it. When there is a need sensed by few and every person understands his responsibility. It was a desolate place. They were saying, send the people away. And while they're preaching, send the people away. He's preaching and preparing for a miracle. You don't get strength from the work but you get strength from the burdens. Weightlifters whining under the load get strength by repetition. And sometimes we want God strengthen me. Okay, you're going to have to repeat the same thing over and over. We understand that with a physical body. Why don't we understand it with the body of Christ? That sometimes God puts us through the paces. And you don't get strength for the work. You get strength from the work. From the burdens. I hope you understand that. Get a, send them away. Power comes out of problems. You know why sometimes we don't have any more of a move of God? We don't bring any more problems. Woman whose sons were about to be taken. All she had was a little cruise of oil. You remember what the prophet said? Go out in the neighborhood and get all the pots you can. He did not specify size or color. He said, you just go bring all the empty pots. A house full of empty pots is problems. But you fill the house with emptiness, and he'll fill it with power. So they brought them in. I, I'm sure they had brown pots and black pots and white pots and yellow pots and big pots and little pots and crack pots. We'll get a few of them every now and then. But they fill the house. And the problem was not the fullness of heaven. It was the emptiness of earth. And as long as there was emptiness on earth, heaven continued to pour out of its fullness. And heaven did not quit pouring out till there wasn't more, any more emptiness. And as long as there's emptiness, you can expect a hungry 
desperate people. You know, I was in a church a year or so back when I was still superintendent, and they were having a little uh, situation, I'll call it that. And one of the men got up and said, you know, look at all these empty pews, and nobody coming to this church. And, of course, they were blaming the pastor because church wasn't growing. And I looked around, and I said, yeah, I said, there's a lot of empty pews here, but I can tell you why there are empty pews here. And they looked at me. I said, there's empty pews here because there's so many empty cars driving up to this building every night. I said, I promise you, if you fill up your cars, every one of you, before you come, your building will be full. Now, that's not what they wanted to hear. But heaven doesn't run out of fullness. Earth runs out of emptiness. And as long as we are hungry, when there is a need, sensed by a few, and every person understands his responsibility. Uh, and there they were. You are on miracle territory. You move God because you move. God doesn't move till you move first. The angels were ascending and descending on a ladder. They were going up ladders with prayers and coming back with answers. But you got to give them something to take up. We got to have enough faith to send the message up. Living in Eastwood in miracle territory. It is the will of God for us to understand it. And when He in performs a miracle it involves people what's in your hand Moses well I'll touch it those empty water pots fill them we have responsibility we we got too many pew potatoes in Pentecost I didn't say couch potatoes you don't know what that is I said pew potatoes but I don't believe in all that jumping and hooping and you don't? You know why we do that? We're full of the Holy Spirit. We are temples of God. So God lives in that. And you understand perfectly in life. If you want the contents to move, you gotta shake the container. Come on, God, move. God said, all right, you do something. All right, Lord. But I don't feel it. God said, I don't feel it till you do. Come on, get with it. By faith. I've heard people, well, I don't believe in shouting in the flesh. That's all I've ever shouted in. And there's plenty of me to shout. If I was shouting in the spirit, I wouldn't know how to shout in the spirit. I'm shouting in the flesh. But it's to the glory of God. When there is a need sensed by a few and every person, do we understand our responsibility? It's your responsibility to pray. It's your responsibility to be loyal. It's your responsibility to worship, not only here tonight, but when you get home. It's your responsibility to witness. And maybe everybody won't do it. Anybody here love Jesus tonight? I said, anybody here love Jesus tonight? Anybody here love Jesus? Is there a few that understands the importance of worship? Let me tell you something. You may out-sing me, and you may out-preach me, and you may out-teach me, but you're not going to out-worship me. <laughs> worship is a common denominator. I can worship as well as the uh, angels in the regal courts of high glory. Move over, Michael. Move over, Gabriel. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Crown him. You want things to move around here? You move. Well, it's not all in the shout. I know that. It's not all in just sitting there either. Regardless of the odds, 
I'd rather believe for something great and get half of it than believe for nothing and get all of it. Regardless of the odds, five fishes, two loaves, what are they among so many? You give what you have. It began with giving. Oh, give of yourself, your time, regardless of the odds. But I've done enough. Look, there's no traffic jam on the second mile. We've got so much to be thankful for. And when you look at the odds, it doesn't look so good. You know, when I started preaching, I started with nothing and I still have most of it. it, it it's hard when whatever Jesus wants doesn't make sense. But when there's a need sensed by few, and every man and woman does what they're responsible to do, regardless of the odds. Someone said, they didn't realize tonight, it may have been Brother Landy. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, I have been cast down, but not destroyed. Philip's translation says, I may have been knocked down, but I've never been knocked out. And how true that was as we spoke of your beloved pastor. Down? Yeah. God looks better from the bottom of the barrel than anywhere else because if you're at the bottom of the barrel, all you can see is up. If you're sitting on a heap, you can see everything around you. So every now and then, when God wants to isolate us for himself, he puts us on the bottom of the barrel. And no need to look anywhere else because we can't see nothing but barrel, but you look up. That's the economy of God when there is a need sensed by a few. And every man, every man. My friend, if the church of yesterday is better than the church of today, we're of all people most miserable. So, don't look at the odds. God, you know the problem with the man that only had one talent? It wasn't that he had one talent. It was just that he looked at the odds and wouldn't use the one he had. When Jesus got through feeding them, there was 12 basketfuls left over. Remember that? Why 12? One for every doubting apostle. God is going to end up with more than he started with when you get plugged into his economy. God's not ever going to come out on the short end of the stick. I promise you that. And, and that little old, poor little old boy, a long way from home and no lunch and He's going to invest everything into the unseen. What you got, son? Well, I got, uh, <clears throat> I got a few fish. How many? Well, why does God get specific? I got two. Give them to me. You, you got anything else? Got a little bread. Well, how much you got? Well, I've got a little, not a whole lot. How much have you got? Well, I can spare you two or three loaves. How much do you have? You mean you want all of it? You don't do business with God in his marketplace. In any number less than all. You cannot settle with God for 50 cents on a dollar. You've got to love the Lord with all your heart, all your might, all your soul, all your strength. God wants all. How many you got, son? Got five. Give it all to me. What am I going to get in return? He never mentioned that. He said, by faith, here it is. I ought to save one loaf, I guess, to get home on in case the whole thing fell through. But I've swallowed the cat, no use to choke on his tail. Here it all is. I'm giving it to you. Take it all. Take it all. That's the kind of spirit that brings a miracle. I don't understand it. I can't see it. But something in me says, give your all. Pour it out. When there is a need, sensed by a few,
I don't know. I've speculated on the 12 basketfuls. The Bible doesn't say, but I just wonder if Jesus didn't call that little boy up after it was over with and say, son, get you some help. I'm giving you these 12 basketfuls. You take us home. You and your family will have a lot to live on for a long time because my God's not in debt to any man. And whatever you invest in him, I'm not just talking about money, but whatever you invest in him, in faith. God's calling for your loyalty tonight. God's calling for your stability. God's calling for your maturity. God's calling for it. God's calling for it. God's telling you that right now you're in miracle. I don't know, I don't know what it looks like, but you're in miracle territory. This very night. I'm telling you, you are living on the very brink. You're, you never know. The priests that were uh, marching toward the River Jordan with the ark when it was out of banks. <laughs> Nothing happened till they, the soles of their feet. They were one step from a miracle, but somebody had to make that last step. Naaman, Naaman, you've been down six times. Why don't you quit? No, you're one dip from a miracle. Sometimes you're one step and sometimes you're one dip. And come on, march around the walls of Jericho and shout. You shout, you know how it doesn't look like it. You're worn out. You've been marching, but you're one shout from a miracle. Somebody here tonight is one step from a miracle. Somebody here tonight is one dip from a miracle. Somebody here tonight is one shout from a miracle. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you're on miracle. Take that next step and let's give God that next dip. Let's give God that next shout because we're living on the brink of the greatest miracle that Eastwood has ever seen. Devil, how do you like that? You're a liar. The church is alive and well, and Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and we acknowledge his sovereignty. We don't have an explanation, but we got a good God, and our God is able to do exceeding abundant. Above all, we can ask a thing. Clap your hands to the Lord. We're on miracle territory. Somebody here needs a miracle tonight. Somebody, you're close. You're close. One step, one dip, one shout. A miracle. Get your eyes and mind off of your five senses. Get plugged in. Ah. Do you believe me? Has anything been created in you? I didn't ask you if you understood this sermon, heard this sermon, or read this sermon. But has something been created? Will you leave with a creative word? God's going to create something. And what does God need? All God's ever needed to create anything is nothing. Everything you see was created out of nothing. You may feel like you're nobody from nowhere going no place. You're the perfect raw material that God needs for a miracle. Oh, I'm telling you, folks, I feel, I literally feel that I'm on miracle territory. Somebody's one step away from it. Somebody's one dip away from it. Somebody's one shout, hallelujah, away from it. And I'm not going to leave here tonight without it. Because Jesus is here, and if he is here, anything he can do is here. Blessed. Oh, let's praise him one more time. Okay, you need a miracle? You need a miracle? Take that step. I challenge you. By faith, not by sight, but by faith. I'm coming for my miracle. You may need a healing miracle. You may need a financial miracle. You may need a relationship miracle. You may need a mental miracle. You may be depressed and oppressed. I'm trying. Don't come because everybody else is coming, but you come for your miracle. When there is a need, since by a few, and everyone knows their responsibility, regardless of the odds, regardless of the odds, regardless of the odds, God is here. And there are no odds with God. Ah. Let's praise you. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, I've come to claim it. It's mine. It was purchased at Calvary. I'm not an intruder. I'm invited to the throne room. 
It's mine. I've come to ask for what's mine. Without a temptation, he'll make a way of escape. It's mine. He'll never leave nor forsake. It's mine. He's with me all the way. I don't know what your way is, but he's there. It's mine. I'm here to claim as a child of God what's already mine, bought and paid for. By his stripes, we are healed. I've done it before and nothing's happened. Do it again. You may need one more dip. You may need one more step. Do it again. I prayed. Pray again. I fasted. Fast again. I worship. Worship again. I'm telling you, God's in this place. You're standing on miracle territory. Claim it. Claim it by an act of faith, not by what you see, but I claim my miracle. Everybody say, Lord. Everybody say, Lord. We claim our pastors total restoration. Total restoration. Total restoration. Lord, we claim for Him a new anointing. Lord, we claim the greatest, the greatest, the greatest revival we've ever seen. You came to do I came to praise the Lord. Focus your mind. Oh, faith, faith, faith. Just a little bit of faith. Just a little bit of faith. All you need is faith, faith, faith. Just, Just a, a little, little bit of faith. Oh, you don't need a whole lot. You don't need a whole lot. Just for you. This is what you got. got. It's called faith, faith. Give it up, on somebody next to you and I want you to pray outwardly for them. Come on. God, whatever they need, healing, financial miracle, restoration, my brother, my sister, I release my faith. The power of two. The power of two. The power of two. We can't do it alone.
the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.